gifts for the Christ child, and then they disappear. They are the first Christian pilgrims, but we don't know where they came from or where they went. The Three Kings are one of the Bible's greatest mysteries. is the largest Gothic building in Northern Europe, and it was built for just one purpose, to house the bones of the three kings. And they're inside this golden shrine, perhaps the only relics of people who actually knew Jesus. I've been in search of the three kings for years. Usually I work with mummies, relics aren't my thing. But the bones in this shrine are different. They could just be the real deal. Before this show's over, I'll show you something about the bones of the three kings that no one's ever seen before. We'll be back here, but first we have to see what we really know about the three kings. Their image is on millions of Christmas cards. We see them kneeling, reverently, before the baby Jesus, offering their gifts. But most of what we think we know about them isn't in the Bible. It's urban myth added much later. Come with me to my local card shop, and I'll show you what I mean. No. Nope, nope. Won't do. Here, look at this one. Yeah, this will, this will be good. What's on the card that's not in the Bible? The crowns. The Bible doesn't say they were kings. That was added later. And the comet. Most astronomers agree the kings weren't following a comet. They weren't even following a star. But we'll talk about that later. Let's keep going. No. Here, here, look at this. The camels are good. The three kings almost certainly came by camel. But you know what? The Bible doesn't even say there were three. Let's see what it does say. In the Bible, there are four versions of the life of Christ, the four Gospels. But the three kings are only mentioned in one, the Gospel of St. Matthew. The earliest copy of the Gospel of St. Matthew is here in Magdalen College, Oxford. It's just a few fragments bought by a tourist in Egypt in 1901. But scholars now believe that they were written within living memory of Jesus. So the story of the three kings is one of the earliest Christian accounts we have. Their story is given only a few lines in Matthew's Gospel. Wise men, following a star, came from the east to Jerusalem and asked its ruler, Herod the Great, where is he that is born king of the Jews? Herod sent them to Bethlehem, where they offered gifts of myrrh, frankincense, and gold. And then they disappear, as mysteriously as they appear. We know them as Balthazar, Melchior, and Gaspar. But that's not in the Bible either. The Bible doesn't even say there were three of them. Everyone assumes that, because they brought three gifts. Nor does the Bible say what country they came from. It just says, There came wise men from the east, saying, Where is he that is born king of the Jews? But we may be able to figure out where they came from. The big clue is the word the Bible originally uses to describe them. Magi. Now, magi is a Persian word. It's not Greek like the rest of the gospel. And it means Persian priest, a follower of the ancient religion of Zoroaster. So to find out more about the three kings, we need to go to Persia, modern Iran. This flame has been burning for 2,000 years. It has never been allowed to go out. It's a Zoroastrian shrine, one of the few left from the time of the three kings. The Zoroastrians believed, just like the Jews, in the coming of a Messiah, whose virgin birth would be heralded by a star. So the Magi were looking for a star and expected it to lead them to a Messiah. 
There's another clue that ties our three kings to ancient Persia. This 6th century mural in Ravenna, Italy, is one of the earliest examples of Christian art, and it shows the three kings. See what they're wearing? Pointed hats, tunics, and trousers. That's another clue. Remember it. You'll see it again. This is ancient Persia's most famous archaeological site, the palace complex of Persepolis. It's ruined, but it gives us one more clue to the origin of the Three Kings. And that clue is here, on the Great East Staircase, leading to the heart of the palace. Here the Persians depicted the different people within their empire. But what I'm after is up here, the Parthians. The reason I'm interested in them is that the Parthians conquered Persia, and by the time Christ was born, were firmly in charge of the country. See what they're wearing? Trousers. No one wore trousers in the ancient Middle East except the Parthians. So if the three kings were from Persia, this is how they would have dressed, in tunics, trousers, and pointed hats, just like the depiction of the three kings in Ravenna. So we can make an educated guess that the three kings came from Persia. Now let's figure out when they visited the infant Jesus. To figure that out, we need to know when Jesus was born. So what year was Jesus born? It's not what you think, and it's all the fault of a monk named Dionysius. He was asked to construct a new Christian calendar to replace the Roman pagan one. Dionysius, a good Christian, decided to start his new calendar with the birth of Christ. He thought he knew when Christ was born, but unfortunately, Dionysius was a lousy mathematician and made mistakes. He based his calculations on the number of years each Roman emperor reigned. Now, here's a standard list of the Roman emperors, kind of like what Dionysius could have used. Now, remember, he's counting back from emperor to emperor to emperor, adding up their reigns to get to the birth of Christ. Now, the problem occurs right here with Augustus. It's during his reign that Christ is born. Now, look at the years he reigned, 31 BC to 14 AD. Remember that. Now, I'm just going to turn the page. Same Augustus, but look at the dates. 27 BC to 14 AD. We've lost four years. How did that happen? Well, during the first four years of his reign, Augustus ruled under his given name, Octavian. And Dionysius, when he was doing his calculations, forgot those four years. So his calendar is four years off. But he made another major error. He forgot the year zero. Now, think about it. Remember our millennium? We went from the year 1999 to the year 2000. And the next year was 2001. Now, when Dionysius did his calculations, he went from the year 1 BC, before Christ, to 1 AD, the year after the birth of Christ. He should have had the year zero, but he forgot it. So his calculation is now five years off, and we've been living with that mistake ever since. That means our millennium celebration in 2000 should have been in 1995. We missed it. And Jesus was born around 5 or 6 BC. Okay, now we've got the correct year. But what about the actual day Jesus was born? By the time Dionysius was writing his calendar, the exact date had been long forgotten. So the church adopted a convenient Roman midwinter celebration, the birth of the sun god, Sol Invictus, that fell on December 25th. It has nothing to do with the actual birth date of Jesus, but that's why we celebrate Christmas on December 25th. So how do we figure out the real date of Jesus' birth? If we want to calculate Jesus' actual birth date, we have to go back to our three kings who sometime around 5 or 6 B.C. were following a star. We need to find out when there was a star that behaved like the star of Bethlehem. 
Remember what the Bible says? Our three wise men from the east saw the star announcing Christ's birth that led them to Herod's court in Jerusalem. Now, if we can find out when, around 5 or 6 BC, such a star appeared, we can pinpoint Jesus' birthday. The Bible tells us this star wasn't visible to them all the time. It reappears as they leave Jerusalem and head south the few miles to Bethlehem. And lo, the star went before them till it came and stood over where the young child was. So the star we're looking for leads the three kings from ancient Persia to Jerusalem, then disappears only to reappear again in the south, leading them to Bethlehem. What kind of star could do that? For centuries, people have been trying to figure out what guided the three kings. But no one has come up with a theory that fits the Bible's description. Until now, let me introduce you to the man who has just solved the problem. The solution to the mystery of the star of Bethlehem begins with this coin. It's Roman and shows a ram looking back at a star and started Professor Michael Molnar, he's the one on the right, an astronomer at Rutgers University on the trail of the three kings. Now, Professor Molnar is not only a professional astronomer, but also an expert on ancient astrology, the idea that the position of the stars and planets above influenced human activity below. Molnar knew that ancient astrologers associated the sign of Aries the Ram with Judea. This coin got Molnar thinking, what event in the sky, in the sign of the Ram, could the three kings have seen? Mike, can, can you show me what the three kings would have seen in the sky? Okay, Bob, uh, in order to understand the star of Bethlehem, we really have to think like an astrologer of 2,000 years ago. And that is what I'm going to show you. We modern astronomers and even the astrologers wouldn't uh, recognize this as being so important. Uh -huh. that's, that's what's really key to this. But to a person of 2,000 years ago who practiced astrology, this was incredibly important, okay. unbelievably important. This program takes us back in time. And here you can see stars rising in the east. We have Venus. That's Venus there? Right. Okay, go ahead. And then Saturn. Okay. And then over here, we can't even see it. It's the moon. It's very close to the sun. And let's just stop it at this point over here. And we have um, uh, Jupiter. And this is Jupiter. Jupiter. Jupiter is really the key player here because Jupiter in those times was the regal star. That is the star of new kings. So Jupiter, you call it the regal star. It's really a planet, but they viewed it as a star, and this was the thing that determined kingship when a king's born, that kind of thing? Ex exactly, Bob. Mm -hmm. Now what I'm going to do is just show you where this happened, though, among the stars of Aries the Ram. This is key, very key to, to this whole interpretation. This is the first day it appears in the east as a morning star. For astrologers, this indicated that Jupiter had maximum power to create a, a, a new king. And they must have been extremely excited to, uh, to see this. Because we know at this time there were rumors uh, that in Judea there was going to be the birth of a Messiah. And because that dot, Jupiter, is in the ram. It means the king's going to be born and in Judea. That's right. So they would go to King Herod to find where, what specific town would this Messiah be born? Now everything's lining up. You've yes. got all these planets, stars, moon, sun, all lining up in Aries. How unusual is it? I mean, is it rare, super rare? The essential parts here of having Saturn in Aries, Jupiter, the moon, and the sun, that was once a lifetime. That was 70 years. But you cannot ignore the other planets, and that's what's very important here. And what we have in this day is that just about all of them are collecting in Aries the Ram, or they are very close. They're on either side of Aries the Ram. So everything focuses on Aries the Ram. So that's almost unique or...? Very unique, exactly. Yeah. Yes. Molnar has found something no one noticed in 2,000 years. At the time of Christ's birth, something absolutely unique was happening in the skies. But you had to be a skilled astrologer to know it. The signs told you a king of kings would be born in Judea. And Molnar even has the date. 
April 17th, 6 BC, just around the time scholars think Jesus was born. But is there anything in the Bible that supports Molnar's date? I think there is. Our theory suggests that Jesus was really born in April, but we need more evidence. Our clue is what the Bible says about the shepherds. They were keeping watch over their flocks by night. That's a clue as to the time of year when Jesus was born. Now, what months were the flocks kept out at night? Well, I'm from the Bronx and have no idea about sheep herding. So let's ask an on-the-spot expert. Ibrahim. Ibrahim. Ah, our expert is Abraham, a good biblical name, and he's been a shepherd in Bethlehem for 70 years. If anyone knows, he does. He says the flocks are out at night only six months of the year, April through September. No animals are left out in the fields in December. It's far too cold in Bethlehem. So we know Jesus wasn't born in December. But the animals are in the fields at night during the spring. This supports Molnar's theory that Jesus was born on April 17th. Molnar believes that the three kings, watching the sky in the east, would have seen these signs and then set out for the long journey to Jerusalem to greet the new King of the Jews. To travel from Persia to Jerusalem 2,000 years ago was no small thing. As the crow flies, it's almost a thousand miles straight through the Arabian desert. And remember, the three kings saw the signs in the heavens on April 17th. Summer was about to begin. To avoid the blistering heat, they may have waited till September before starting out on their journey. Now, they're starting out in Persia. This is modern Iran. And Jerusalem's over here. But they're not going to take the direct route. They'd have to cross a vast desert. What I think they do is they leave Persia, go into modern Iraq, past ancient Babylon, and follow the Tigris and Euphrates rivers. They've got a water source. Then, at the narrow point of the desert, they cross it to Aleppo. From Aleppo, it's an easy route down to Jerusalem. Now, I can't be sure that this is their exact route. But what I am sure of is it took them months to get to Jerusalem. But why go to Jerusalem and not straight to Bethlehem? Well, the star they were following only led them to a general area the country of Judea. The sign on April 17th said a great king would be born in Judea. It didn't indicate the city. By the time they reached Jerusalem, the capital of Judea, it was winter. The infant Jesus was now several months old. Unfortunately for our three kings, they were entering dangerous territory. Herod the king the Romans had placed on the throne of Judea was given to violent rages. The Bible's bad guy deserves his bloody reputation. He'd already killed a wife, several sons, and hundreds of political opponents. But he was also one of the greatest builders of all time. Herod built the citadel on top of Masada, the steep mountain where the Jews staged a desperate last fight against Roman legions. Herod also built the huge Temple Mount in Jerusalem. When Jews pray in front of the Wailing Wall today, they are praying in front of a wall built by Herod. Look at the size of those blocks. They're huge. Let me show you where he got the stone. Beneath the city of Jerusalem is a lost world. The caves where Herod quarried the huge blocks for his building projects. Once, hundreds of masons worked by the light of oil lamps, cutting the blocks for the Wailing Wall and the second temple that it enclosed. Herod 
built the second temple on Temple Mount. And the three kings must have walked up these steps when they were looking for Jesus. These steps led to an area that was open to both Gentiles and Jews. This is where everybody came for news and gossip. This is where the three kings had to have come to find out where the new king of the Jews had been born. But there was a problem. Herod's spies learned that there were three foreigners in town asking difficult questions, and they reported it immediately to Herod. In the fall of 6 BC, when the three kings were in Jerusalem, Herod was not a happy camper. He had all kinds of ailments and was in constant pain. For relief, his royal galley rowed him across the Dead Sea to the therapeutic baths at Zara Springs in present-day Jordan. Herod was suffering from chronic kidney disease and gangrene of the genital. That caused him intense itching, pain in his intestines, convulsions, and paranoia. No fun. So he came to these springs to soak his diseased body. I sure hope it gave him some relief, because when the three kings showed up, he had even bigger problems. You've got a paranoid king in constant physical pain who is told that three foreigners are wandering around Jerusalem asking, where is he that is born king of the Jews? The Bible says that Herod was troubled by the news. I can tell you why he was troubled. There was a prophecy that a Messiah would come and free the Jews from Roman oppression. If that happened, Herod was history. But in spite of his terrible pain, itching, and paranoia, Herod kept his cool. He summoned his priests to find out if they knew anything about the new king of the Jews. They were probably aware of several Old Testament prophecies that the king of the Jews would be born in Bethlehem. So they told him Bethlehem was the birthplace of the new Messiah. On a December evening, 2,000 years ago, Herod held his meeting with the three kings here in his headquarters in Jerusalem. The Bible tells us it was in secret. You see, Herod didn't want everybody knowing there was a new king of the Jews born who could replace him. So he sent the three kings off to Bethlehem, and he said, when you find him, send me word so that I can come and worship him too. Herod wasn't about to worship the new king, but he knew that if he sent his soldiers, the child would be hidden. Herod was using the three kings for his own devious purposes. Probably worried by Herod's violent rages, the three kings left immediately, traveling at night through the streets of what is now the Armenian section of Jerusalem. It was a five-mile journey to Bethlehem, and once again, the Bible says they saw a star. Matthew tells us that as they set out, the star went before them till it came and stood over where the young child was. For centuries, people have been wondering what it could possibly mean. But now we know. Remember, it was a unique astrological configuration of the heavens that led the three kings to Jerusalem in the first place? And now, a star seems to be doing something impossible again, guiding them to Bethlehem. What could it be? Let's ask our expert, Professor Molnar. So, Mike, we, we've got the three kings to Jerusalem. Mm. Do you have any idea what they're following when they go from Jerusalem to Bethlehem? Okay, well, let's take a look at the program again. And let's watch the motion of Jupiter from April 17, 6 BC, when it was in the east, to later this year, towards uh, December. We're now going to speed up time. Now, watch what happens to Jupiter. Okay, it's moving out. It stops and goes back. Right. And it's going backwards. Yes, right. that's right, exactly. It's going this way in the sky. And the way the astrologers described this, they said that Jupiter went before or went forward. Now, here's an interesting tie-in in with Bible. the biblical account, because the biblical account said the star went before them. So Molnar has explained 
what went before them means in the Bible. Can he explain stood over where the young child was? Now look at the sky as viewed from Jerusalem. And here is Jupiter. Right. And down in this direction is Bethlehem. Right. And guess where Jupiter is among the constellations? It's in Aries the Ram. Aries the Ram, exactly. So to the astrologers, the sky is moving, but Jupiter, the regal star, isn't moving. It's moving, not moving among the stars. Right. It is stationary. Right. The so stars it's are still moving. Still. The heavens still are moving. Right. Jupiter is standing still over Bethlehem. So it's really all about Jupiter. Exactly, Bob. The star of Bethlehem was Jupiter. His theory is the only one that explains everything. First, it explains how Jupiter and astrological signs led the three kings to Jerusalem. Next, it explains how Jupiter then led the three kings to Bethlehem. And it even gives us the date, December 19, 6 BC. Molnar's knowledge of ancient astrology has solved a 2,000-year-old mystery. Incredible, even today, you can still find the exact spot where the three kings first saw the star standing over Bethlehem. I'm walking the route from Jerusalem to Bethlehem. And for the first few miles, you can't see Bethlehem at all. Then you come over this hill, and there it is. This is where the three kings saw the star guiding them to their goal, Bethlehem. So the star got them to Bethlehem on December 19th, 6 BC. That means Jesus was already eight months old. But where did they find the Holy Family? Not in an inn, probably in a house not very different from this one. Ah, Maria, Anna, Anna, Vic. Can you show it? Sure, can. The mistress of the house, Miriam, explains that like many old houses in Bethlehem, the sheep and goats were kept in a cave, what's now her kitchen, and the family lived upstairs. The Bible tells us that when Joseph and Mary got to Bethlehem, the houses were full. Not an inn. That's a mistranslation. There were no inns or hotels as we know them in the time of Jesus. They were offered the only space available in Bethlehem, the cave downstairs where the animals were kept. That's why Mary put Jesus in the manger, a trough used to feed the animals. This is the Church of the Nativity. It's built right over a small rough cave, just like Miriam's kitchen. It is said that this is where Jesus was born. No one can be sure that this is the exact spot, but only 160 years after Jesus died, this was recognized as his birthplace. So here, in this cave, the three kings gave Jesus the gifts they had brought all the way from Persia. Gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Why these three gifts? Well, gold is easy. It was the most precious metal in the world. An obvious gift for the three kings to bring. But why frankincense and myrrh? They're just tree sap. I'll tell you why. Frankincense and myrrh were worth more than gold and were sent all over the ancient world. Today, people still come to the Cairo Spice Bazaar to buy frankincense and myrrh for digestive problems. But that's not why the three kings valued them. In ancient Egypt, incense made from frankincense and myrrh was called what the gods smell. 
Even today, in the Church of the Nativity, clouds of frankincense and myrrh rise up to the heavens. What more appropriate gift for the new Messiah? So the real story of the three kings forces us to change our idea of the nativity. Jesus wasn't born in an inn. It was the area of a house where animals were kept. The baby Jesus is still fine in the manger, but the three kings weren't there for the nativity. By the time they got to Bethlehem, Jesus wasn't the newborn. He was practically crawling. But the shepherds are okay. They were there. We also have to give up the idea that the nativity scene took place on December 25th. Jesus was probably born on April 17th. But I don't think we're about to change Christmas. So now it's time for the three kings to return home. But what to do about Herod's request to tell him the exact location of Jesus? The Bible tells us something very interesting happened now. And being warned of God in a dream that they should not return to Herod, they departed into their own country another way. Now it's interesting that this information came to the three kings in a dream because Persian magi were supposed to be able to do magic and interpret dreams. Our world's magic comes from magi. Remember those pointy hats the magi wore? That's the origin of our wizard's hat from Merlin to Harry Potter. Dreams would have been right up the Three Kings Alley. Magi were famous in the ancient world for interpreting dreams. The Three Kings may have even had a dream book. One where if you had a dream, you could look it up and see what it meant. Now, I wish I had a Magi dream book to show you, but I don't, none have survived. But I've got an Egyptian one and I think it'll give us a good idea of what was involved. Let me show you how it worked. Let's say you had a dream about sailing in a boat. You'd look it up in this column. And here it is, sailing in a boat. Then you'd go to this column to see what it means. And it's good. It says, soon you'll be with your friends. Now, as Magi, the three kings were very skilled in dream interpretation. So when the dream came from God, they knew to listen to it, and they knew what it meant. The more clues we piece together about the three kings, the more the Bible story makes sense. Think about it. In the Bible, the three kings are guided by their knowledge of the heavens and dream interpretation. Just the skills we know the Magi were trained in. So thanks to the dream, the three kings returned home another way, without letting Herod know where Jesus was. The Bible tells us Herod slew all the children that were in Bethlehem from two years old and under. In an underground cave near the Church of the Nativity in Bethlehem, you can see bones purported to be those of the innocents slain by Herod. Now why include children up to the age of two? If the three kings had reached Jesus shortly after his birth, as we've all been taught to believe, there would be no need to kill children as old as two years every baby under six months of age would do. But Molnar's theory shows us that the three kings didn't reach Jesus until he was over eight months old. Besides, Herod didn't know exactly when he was born. So killing all two-year-olds was just the kind of ruthless behavior we might expect of him. It's a very moving place, but we really don't know how old these bones are. If you look closely at them, you can see that many are adults. The long bones and crania are far too large and developed for young children. 
So how did Jesus escape? Joseph and Mary, warned of Herod's savage plan, fled into Egypt. They might even have taken Jesus, who was a toddler by now, to visit the pyramids and Sphinx. To this day, pilgrims visit a tree near Cairo that they believe marks the spot where the Holy Family stopped to rest. And there's a story that backs this up. Thirty years before Jesus was born, Egypt's Queen Cleopatra imported the famous trees of Gilead from Judea to this area of Cairo. It's likely that she also brought Judean gardeners to care for the trees. So 30 years later, when Mary, Joseph, and Jesus fled into Egypt, they ran to a community of their countrymen from Judea. A couple of years later, when Herod died, they returned home. And that's where the Bible ends the story of the three kings. They are never mentioned again. So where do we get all these ideas about them that aren't in the Bible? Come with me and I'll show you. I want to take you in search of the three kings. At least what people think they look like. When I was a kid growing up in the Bronx, they used to have fabulous Christmas lights in the Italian neighborhoods. And somebody always had a nativity scene. And that's what I want to find. A really great nativity scene. No, that's not it. Frosty the Snowman won't do. Uh, no. Santa Claus won't do either. Great lights, but just not a nativity scene yet. No. Pretty, but no. Not yet. But this is the right neighborhood. We're going to find something. Just stop for the stop sign. I don't get killed here looking for the three kings. That's nice. There it is. Let me just pull over. I think we've got our three wise men here. There it is. Come on. This is the kind of nativity scene I was looking for. You've got Joseph. You've got Mary and the infant Jesus. You've got the animals. And there are the three kings. And can you see what they have in their hands? They're bringing the three gifts, frankincense, myrrh, and gold. But look at their faces. One's dark, the other one has a ruddy complexion, and the third one's fair. Now that's not in the Bible. That's a later tradition that the three kings came from different continents. But that's how people started to look at the three kings, in a way very different from the Bible. Let's look at our 6th century Ravenna mosaic. You remember, where we saw the three kings with pointy hats and trousers? Look closely at their faces. One has a white beard. He's old. One has a black beard. He's middle-aged. And the young one has no beard at all. So as early as the 6th century, there was a tradition that the three kings were of different ages. There's another tradition, that they were buried together. And you know, they might just still be together, but in a place you'd never expect. The last stop on our Three Kings incredible journey is a place you would never guess in a million years, Cologne, Germany. And almost as amazing as their journey is the cathedral built to house their remains. See that? It's not the traditional cross. It's a star, the star the three kings followed. These walls protect what may be the holiest relics in all of Christendom, the bones of the three kings. Their remains have been here for more than eight centuries. This is one of the greatest medieval treasures in the world. There's nothing else like it. It's an incredibly powerful piece of religious art and dominates the cathedral. But what's inside might be even more incredible. See that panel on top? It's removable. And just behind it are the skulls of the three kings.
But are they really the skulls of the three kings? The problem is that during the Middle Ages, hundreds of fake relics, supposedly from the time of Christ, were produced. An inventory of the relics in cathedrals in Europe should convince anyone that the chances of the bones being the three kings are slim. Paris has the crown of thorns from the crucifixion of Jesus. Rome has Jesus' umbilical cord. Aachen had his swaddling of baby clothes. Trier his coat. And Bruges, a capsule of his blood. And three separate towns in France alone claim to have the head of John the Baptist. But these are all medieval relics and appear only from the 8th century onwards. So if the bones in the cathedral are medieval, the chances are high that they're also fake. So can we prove that the bones of the three kings are earlier than the Middle Ages? The answer is yes. And the proof was painted on the wall of the cathedral in the 14th century. We want to see if the bones of the three kings are earlier than the Middle Ages. Here's a clue. See the lady with the crown? She's the Roman Emperor Constantine's mother, St. Helena. And the bones of the three kings are here because of Helena's incredible shopping spree. In the fourth century, Helena was buying relics associated with the life of Christ. Now, see that box? The bones of the three kings are inside. She bought the bodies of the three kings and brought them to her hometown, Constantinople. That's what's going on here. But Constantinople was just the first stop for the three kings. This painting shows the bones arriving in Cologne some 800 years ago. Now think about what the paintings on the wall tell us. The relics can't be medieval forgeries. We can trace the bones back through the centuries, from Cologne, and all the way back to St. Helena in the 4th century. But is there any other evidence that the bones are really ancient? I think so. Our next clue is the textile found wrapped around the bones of the three kings. See the two tiny purple fragments? The dye comes from Phoenicia. It's the right area, the Middle East. It's not made in Europe. And the weave is Syrian, from the second or third century. Far too old for the usual medieval forgery. We are still in the ball game. We may just have the real thing. The cloth is neat, but my specialty is mummies, and I'd love to get my hands on the bones. But no one's been permitted to examine them in centuries. But I have plan B. I've got the only photo of the skulls behind the panel. At my university, CW Post, we have a great information technology department. It's a long shot, but let's see if we can tell anything from the photo. Hey, Trish. Hi, Bob. How are you? Good. This is the disc. If you can pop it in and pull up the image, I'll show you what I need. Okay. I think it's pretty clear, so I think it'll work. Let's, let me just show you. Okay, here's yeah. your image. Okay, now, what well, this is, this is the shrine, and in it are the bodies of the three kings, and what we're looking at is the back of the skulls. Now, what I'm interested in is just the skulls. Okay, just this area right here? Yeah, just the skulls. The crowns are good, too. How does yeah, that, that would be perfect. Now, can we see what, that's what it's going to look like? Okay. This is what it will look Ooh. like, cropped. Yeah, that'd be great. Now, can we blow that up and get a really good image, or will it be fuzzy, grainy? Yeah, you've got an excellent quality picture here, so we'll be able to blow that up quite nicely. Um, oh, okay. Do you want to go ahead and print yeah, this? Yeah, please, please, please. It's cutting it loose. That's it. Ooh, fabulous. This is our photo. It is beautiful. I think we're going to be able to figure out something. But let me show you what I want to look at. These are the backs of the skulls of the three kings. Now, this area here is called a suture. 
The skull is made up of several bones, and those bones meet at the sutures. Now, let me show you a real skull of a young person right here. You can see the sutures. Now, because this is a young individual, the sutures are still open, clearly visible. As you get older, they knit, they get tighter. Now, this is a real skull of an old person. And you can see the sutures are gone. You can hardly see them. They're tight. Now, let's look at our three kings. This skull here, just like this one. It's a young person. Sutures are open. This king, you can see some of the sutures here. Not fully closed, but not really open. This is a middle-aged person. And over here, we've clearly got an old person where you can't even see the sutures. It's fully closed. It's really neat. That story that for centuries was going around about the three kings, one being young, one being middle-aged, one being old, this confirms it. These bones really are of a young, middle-aged, and old person. For me, the search for the three kings has been an amazing experience. Not my usual cup of tea, so I've had lots of surprises. The photo's not a smoking gun. We can't conclude that the skulls really are the three kings. But isn't it amazing that when you put all the evidence together, it's still a real possibility. Bones can be traced back to the 4th century, not the usual medieval forgery. Purple dye and pattern from the Middle East. Right geographic area, not European. Cranial sutures suggest young, middle, and aged individuals. Same ages as the early legend. Conclusion, the bones could just be the real thing. This shrine may hold the holiest relics in all of Christendom. We owe a lot to the three wise men. The idea of Christmas gifts comes from our three kings. Inside, inside is a box. Every Christmas, friends gather at my place for a ritual we call the Christmas grab bag. What they don't know is that they owe this ritual to the three kings. Everyone brings a wrapped present and puts it in the grab bag. Then we all draw lots to see who picks first. Musical snowman ornament. Oh, wow. Here it is. The book. Wow. Yeah, we, hey, little mummies. Yeah, we have one of these. Little mummies. It's all wacky, and everyone has a good time. But the very idea of giving presents at Christmas comes from the three kings who brought frankincense, myrrh, and gold to the baby Jesus. But there's one more debt we owe to our Persian kings. Ancient Persians shook hands. This was never a Greek, Roman, Egyptian, or Hebrew custom. Other cultures saluted, bowed, hugged, kissed, or even raised their hats. But handshaking was a Persian gesture of friendship and honesty. So every time you shake someone's hand, think of the three kings and their incredible journey. Christ child, and then they disappear. They are the first Christian pilgrims, but we don't know where they came from or where they went. The three kings are one of the Bible's greatest mysteries. Cologne Cathedral is the largest Gothic building in Northern Europe, and it was built for just one purpose, to house the bones of the three kings. And they're inside this golden shrine, perhaps the only relics of people who actually knew Jesus. 
I've been in search of the Three Kings for years. Usually I work with mummies. Relics aren't my thing. But the bones in this shrine are different. They could just be the real deal. Before this show's over, I'll show you something about the bones of the Three Kings that no one's ever seen before. We'll be back here. But first, we have to see what we really know about the Three Kings. Their image is on millions of Christmas cards. We see them kneeling, reverently, before the baby Jesus, offering their gifts. But most of what we think we know about them isn't in the Bible. It's urban myth, added much later. Come with me to my local card shop, and I'll show you what I mean. Nope, nope, won't do. Here, look at this one. Yeah, this will, this will be good. What's on the card that's not in the Bible? The crowns. The Bible doesn't say they were kings. That was added later. And the comet. Most astronomers agree the kings weren't following a comet. They weren't even following a star. But we'll talk about that later. Let's keep going. No. Here, here, look at this. The camels are good. The three kings almost certainly came by camel. But you know what? The Bible doesn't even say there were three. Let's see what it does say. In the Bible, there are four versions of the life of Christ, the four Gospels. But the three kings are only mentioned in one, the Gospel of St. Matthew. The earliest copy the Gospel of St. Matthew is here in Magdalen College, Oxford. It's just a few fragments bought by a tourist in Egypt in 1901. But scholars now believe that they were written within living memory of Jesus. So the story of the three kings is one of the earliest Christian accounts we have. Their story is given only a few lines in Matthew's Gospel. Wise men following a star came from the east to Jerusalem and asked its ruler, Herod the Great, where is he that is born king of the Jews? Herod sent them to Bethlehem, where they offered gifts of myrrh, frankincense, and gold. And then they disappeared, as mysteriously as they appeared. We know them as Balthazar, Melchior, and Gaspar. But that's not in the Bible either. The Bible doesn't even say there were three of them. Everyone assumes that because they brought three gifts. Nor does the Bible say what country they came from. It just says, There came wise men from the east, saying, Where is he that is born king of the Jews? But we may be able to figure out where they came from. The big clue is the word the Bible originally uses to describe them. Magi. Now, Magi is a Persian word. It's not Greek like the rest of the gospel. And it means Persian priest, a follower of the ancient religion of Zoroaster. So to find out more about the three kings, we need to go to Persia, modern Iran. This flame has been burning for 2,000 years. It has never been allowed to go out. It's a Zoroastrian shrine, one of the few left from the time of the Three Kings. The Zoroastrians believed, just like the Jews, in the coming of a Messiah, whose virgin birth would be heralded by a star. So the Magi were looking for a star and expected it to lead them to a Messiah. There's another clue that ties our Three Kings to ancient Persia. This 6th century mural in Ravenna, Italy, is one of the earliest examples of Christian art, and it shows the three kings. See what they're wearing? Pointed hats, tunics, and trousers. That's another clue. Remember it. You'll see it again. This is ancient Persia's most famous archaeological site, the palace complex of Persepolis. It's ruined but it gives us one more clue to the origin of the Three Kings. And that clue is here, on the Great East Staircase, leading to the heart of the palace. 
Here the Persians depicted the different people within their empire. But what I'm after is up here, the Parthians. The reason I'm interested in them is that the Parthians conquered Persia and by the time Christ was born were firmly in charge of the country. See what they're wearing? Trousers. No one wore trousers in the ancient Middle East except the Parthians. So if the three kings were from Persia, this is how they would have dressed, in tunics, trousers, and pointed hats, just like the depiction of the three kings in Ravenna. So we can make an educated guess that the three kings came from Persia. Now let's figure out when they visited the infant Jesus. To figure that out, we need to know when Jesus was born. So what year was Jesus born? It's not what you think, and it's all the fault of a monk named Dionysius. He was asked to construct a new Christian calendar to replace the Roman pagan one. Dionysius, a good Christian, decided to start his new calendar with the birth of Christ. He thought he knew when Christ was born, but unfortunately, Dionysius was a lousy mathematician and made mistakes. He based his calculations on the number of years each Roman emperor reigned. Now, here's a standard list of the Roman emperors, kind of like what Dionysius could have used. Now, remember, he's counting back from emperor to emperor to emperor, adding up their reigns to get to the birth of Christ. Now, the problem occurs right here with Augustus. It's during his reign that Christ is born. Now, look at the years he reigned, 31 BC to 14 AD. Remember that. Now, I'm just going to turn the page. Same Augustus, but look at the dates. 27 B.C. to 14 A.D. We've lost four years. How did that happen? Well, during the first four years of his reign, Augustus ruled under his given name, Octavian. And Dionysius, when he was doing his calculations, forgot those four years. So his calendar is four years off. But he made another major error. He forgot the year zero. Now, think about it. Remember our millennium? We went from the year 1999 to the year 2000. And the next year was 2001. Now, when Dionysius did his calculations, he went from the year 1 BC, before Christ, to 1 AD, the year after the birth of Christ. He should have had the year zero but he forgot it. So his calculation is now five years off, and we've been living with that mistake ever since. That means our millennium celebration in 2000 should have been in 1995. We missed it. And Jesus was born around five or six BC. Okay, now we've got the correct year. But what about the actual day Jesus was born? By the time Dionysius was writing his calendar, the exact date had been long forgotten. So the church adopted a convenient Roman midwinter celebration, the birth of the sun god, Sol Invictus, that fell on December 25th. It has nothing to do with the actual birth date of Jesus, but that's why we celebrate Christmas on December 25th. So how do we figure out the real date of Jesus' birth? If we want to calculate Jesus' actual birth date, we have to go back to our three kings, who sometime around 5 or 6 BC were following a star. We need to find out when there was a star that behaved like the star of Bethlehem. Remember what the Bible says? Our three wise men from the east saw the star announcing Christ's birth that led them to Herod's court in Jerusalem. Now, if we can find out when, around 5 or 6 BC, such a star appeared, we can pinpoint Jesus' birthday. The Bible tells us this star wasn't visible to them all the time. It reappears as they leave Jerusalem and head south the few miles to Bethlehem. And lo, the star went before them till it came and stood over where the young child was. 
So the star we're looking for leads the three kings from ancient Persia to Jerusalem, then disappears, only to reappear again in the south, leading them to Bethlehem. What kind of star could do that? For centuries, people have been trying to figure out what guided the three kings. But no one has come up with a theory that fits the Bible's description. Until now, let me introduce you to the man who has just solved the problem. The solution to the mystery of the Star of Bethlehem begins with this coin. It's Roman and shows a ram looking back at a star and started Professor Michael Molnar, he's the one on the right, an astronomer at Rutgers University on the Trail of the Three Kings. Now, Professor Molnar is not only a professional astronomer, but also an expert on ancient astrology, the idea that the position of the stars and planets above influence human activity below. Molnar knew that ancient astrologers associated the sign of Aries the Ram with Judea. This coin got Molnar thinking, what event in the sky, in the sign of the Ram, could the three kings have seen? Mike, can you show me what the three kings would have seen in the sky? Okay, Bob, uh, in order to understand the star of Bethlehem, we really have to think like an astrologer of 2,000 years ago. And that is what I'm going to show you. We modern astronomers and even the astrologers wouldn't uh, recognize this as being so important. Uh -huh. that's, that's what's really key to this. But to a person of 2,000 years ago who practiced astrology, this was incredibly important, okay. unbelievably important. This program takes us back in time. And here you can see stars rising in the east. We have Venus. That's Venus there? Right. Okay, go ahead. And then Saturn. Okay. And then over here, we can't even see it. It's the moon. It's very close to the sun. And let's just stop it at this point over here. And we have um, uh, Jupiter. And this is Jupiter. Jupiter. Jupiter is really the key player here because Jupiter in those times was the regal star. That is the star of new kings. So Jupiter, you call it the regal star. It's really a planet, but they viewed it as a star, and this was the thing that determined kingship when a king's born, that kind of thing? Ex exactly, Bob. Mm -hmm. Now what I'm going to do is just show you where this happened, though, among the stars of Aries the Ram. This is key, very key to, to this whole interpretation. This is the first day it appears in the east as a morning star. For astrologers, this indicated that Jupiter had maximum power to create a, a, a new king. And they must have been extremely excited to, uh, to see this. Because we know at this time there were rumors uh, that in Judea there was going to be